Hello and welcome back, those of you who have made it back from lunch. We've still got plenty of stragglers, but we're going to um, get on with it. I know you've had a, a packed uh, and busy morning, but similarly, this afternoon is going to be full of uh, debate. So, uh, starting with democratising the economy, a plan to take control. We have got a slight uh, change to advertise. Sadly, it's, um, Liz from the Centre for Thriving Places is poorly. So, thankfully, Emma Laycock, Head of Memberships at Cooperatives UK, is stepping in uh, to the conversation. And she's joined by Sarah Longlands, who's the Chief Exec of Claire's. We've got Ollie Wilson, who is just starting Beyond the Music Co-op. Uh, we will be joined uh, via the screen um, from um, Andy Street, the Mayor of the West Midlands. Uh, but I'm going to hand over to one of the best moderators I know, no pressure, but over to John Robb. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rose. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so let's get going with the panel. So first thing I want to ask, uh, it's you, Sarah. So can you explain, Claire's? and, uh, and uh, how much more democratisation, the whole process of it. In fact, I'm into a bit of demystification here today to uh, understand what the terms, what these terms are and what roles they do, and also the upsides and downsides of all these things as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah th thanks, John, and thanks to Co-ops UK for the invitation this afternoon. It's, it's really good to be here, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing some of the questions and debate after. Um, CLES is uh, the Centre for Local Economic Strategies. We were set up back in the 1980s and um, we're based here in, in Manchester. And we are a, a champion for radical economic change through local delivery. And, and for us, that's about economies that generate good lives for people, for place and for planet. Um, and we talk a lot about building wealth for communities, building community wealth. Um, and we, we, we like to think of ourselves as one of the, the kind of UK centres for community wealth building in, uh, in the UK. And we do work across the UK, and especially in Scotland and Wales at the minute. And I think where we start from on that journey around community wealth is that, that too many people feel at the mercy of the economy. It's something that's done to people rather than with them. And we, I was in the social care session just before lunch, and you really see that in something like social care, that extraction of wealth from people um, in order to, to fund profits of, of, of big capital. And what we want to do, what we try to deliver on the ground is to get wealth flowing into communities and not relying on outdated ideas like trickle down or, or property development um, but where money kind of gets locked up and kind of frozen. Um, but it's about getting the economy back in the hands of people. Um, it's about a generative economy. Um, it's about money circulating in a place. It's about ethical business practice um, and it's about the using the wealth that we have got and we've got loads of wealth in this country um, using that wealth to really do much much more um, you know for example organizations that have their base or their their foundation in a particular a town or city what can they do to really ensure that they're they're raising standards that they're they're leading by example you know for example paying people a decent wage giving people a proper contract um, uh, and really, and, and putting that, that money back into uh, a place. So, that, so that, that's, what, that's what we're all about. I mean, we were talking before, uh, before the panel, and you were saying you live in Bolton. Yep. And Any Boltonians out there? Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, it's, it's like a lot of towns. I, I mean, obviously, Manchester, the centre of Manchester is booming, yeah. and you know, you can feel the energy here. But those surrounding towns and going further and further out, there's a feeling of being yeah. disconnected. Yep. And so the ideas that you're talking about here, do people know about these ideas? Do they know how to access these ideas? Mm -hmm. And if so, how can they access these ideas? Yeah. Well, I think, I'm ha happy to tell you, it's still a work in progress. I, I think people instinctively, when you talk to people in Bolton, people instinctively feel that something has gone wrong with the economy, that they, they don't feel that they have a sense of control uh, over their own lives. And, and that's not really surprising, because when you look at the challenges, the real pain out there, in, in particularly in, um, uh, in Greater Manchester, in places like Bolton, but also Oldham and, um, uh, and so on. You know, people find it a really struggle to pay their rents, they're struggling to pay their energy costs, they're struggling to get good health and social care for their, for their, um, for their family. I think people instinctively feel that there's something that, that's gone wrong, that, 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 is, that is not working right, and that they have very little control over it. They don't know almost sometimes where to turn to deal with it. And I think that sense of being sort of disabled from the system 
um, is something that you know, I, I think you see a lot in places like Bolton. Um, and I think it also asks big questions of democracy um, and devolution as to how we can use new forms of democracy to really involve and, 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 and you know, enable people a chance to participate in the process. I mean, how would you like to see these ideas get to people? Would it, would it even be something as radical as making it part of the education system? Or? Potentially. I mean, I think, um, I, I think politically, you know, we've lost a lot of the... We, what we need is opportunities for people to have the conversations for activism to emerge, and I think we've lost a lot of those opportunities. So I think there's something about, you know, political education, definitely. Um, but I think it's also, like, all the stuff that the, the, the co-ops movement do as well, where you're actually demonstrating to people, you know, we had a challenge, we had a problem, but look, we, we got together... Um, we, we, we made something happen and, and we're, we're kind of doing it for ourselves and I think there is something powerful about that example rather than, you know, someone like me or, or MP or something, you're pontificating. I think it's more about people actually helping each other and showing that we, it doesn't have to be like this, you know. There are alternatives and if we support each other and we work with each other, um, we, we, can make, we can make stuff happen. But I think that's difficult at the minute when people are, you know, dealing with a lot of pain in their everyday lives. I mean, when you take these ideas out to people, I mean, I, I guess, imagine at first people go, oh, I didn't know this kind of thing existed. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the next question, how do I do it? I mean, yeah. what, what sort of, I mean, what kind of information do you feel has to be taken to people? Well, I think there's, um, I think there's, there's, I guess, part of it is just, I guess, awakening that sense that people can do something. You know, for me, it's all about agency. You know, what... What, you know, we were just talking about this before, um, uh, before we came on about, you know, when you think back to like the Rochdale pioneers, you know, what gave them the, the, the kind of gumption to, to go ahead and, and, and set it up, to make it happen, to raise the money? Um, and, and, you know, we were talking about kind of what, what we thought might be behind that, but it, it's something which gave them the agency, the, the ability to, to, to do something about the challenge that they face, not just sort of, you know, sink into a kind of sense of hopelessness about it, but actually to get out there and, and drive and, and, and strive for something better for their families and their communities. And I think it's about giving people the sense that it is possible, showing examples of where it is going on, uh, and also giving people the opportunities, you know, whether it's in, the, in, the, in community centres or it's in the pub or it's in shops, you know, giving people a chance to actually meet, talk about this stuff, and, and, and awaken that sense that, we don't, it doesn't have to be like this. We can do something. I and mean, if we do it together, it's going to be even better. Like and celebrating the successes and yes, demystifying think, the process. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, what, what do we need to make co-ops thrive then? Well, I think, you know, following on from what Sarah said, it's very much, you know, sometimes it's scary. And sometimes, you know, we need to, I think you're going to come on and talk about your new co-op. It's not always easy. It can be daunting. <clears throat> in, in what kind of ways? Just because it's a lot of unknowns? It's a lot of unknowns, and I think some people are maybe used to having had things done to them or for them, and this is very much about taking responsibility, which can be really empowering, but at the same time, really quite scary. You are taking responsibility for something. You might not fully understand what that means. Um, and so I think in terms of what makes them strive, it's exactly what you were saying. It's about, you're not doing this on your own. This is a collective endeavor. You're coming together to do something that's going to improve not just your lives, but your community's lives, your members' lives. Um, and I think, you know, we were just talking earlier that often the people that want to set up co-ops, they don't know how to run businesses, but they, they understand values. They understand that they have a problem that they need to fix. But we almost expect them to be business people immediately once they set up a co-op um, and so I think in terms of how they strive it's not doing this on your own there's lots of support out there and it's recognizing that you do need support COPS UK and Claire's and lots of other organizations have got have got support there's many of them here today co-op development workers and practitioners in the community at grassroots level that can provide that support and I think it's about sharing those stories and principle six in action which is cooperation amongst co-ops and offering that peer support and um, it is it is about demystifying the process and helping people to see what the benefits are going to be so like a co-op of co-ops <laughs> cooperating <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah that's when co-ops work best when mm. when they cooperate with each other when they support each other and they share their stories and what's worked well for them and not so much um, you know, then the next person is going to make Is that a seamless mistakes. kind of process? Or is it like anything in life with human beings? It stops and it starts, bits work, bits don't work. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess in terms of which ones strive, 
it's the ones that can actually carry on and keep on taking it forward. Some won't be able to do that. It will be too big for them. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it stops, it starts, you have setbacks. Um, but I think that taking back control over your own lives when you feel like every, you know, it's all been taken away from you and doing something for yourself and for your community, obviously that, that's often what helps you to get to where you need to get to. And Sarah was saying, you know, when you speak to people, you know, they're thinking of setting up co-ops. Do people feel like they can't do it? Do we, there's a lack of confidence in the UK. Well, I think, number one, not enough people know what a co-op is. And so they may be not immediately thinking, I want to set up a co-op. It's, I've got a problem, or my community's got a problem, or um, I want to take control of where I live, how I work. And they might not immediately think that of a co-op. They might even, you know, not even know what it is. And so in terms of, um, say, the ownership hub or the business support program that COPS UK runs, that is very much about making sure that people know what a co-op is. If you think it's for you, then what the process is that you actually need to go through. And specifically with the ownership hub, it is about concentrating that support in an area so that you can really see that difference. Because once you set up one in an area, then you'll see another one, and they do become a thriving place. So what do you mean by Ownership Hub? The Ownership Hub um, is a, a programme that we, COPS UK, runs jointly with Employee Ownership Association. It's designed to stimulate co-ops, as say, by concentrating support for co-ops in a, in a place. Um, we've been running one in South Yorkshire. We've recently launched one in Greater London. And I think we're going to have a video shortly um, where we're going to be announcing that the next one will be in the West Midlands and that will focus on creatives and, and culture, and um, that historically co-ops thrive around creatives and culture because these are people who want to take control of their, mm -hmm. their lives, their, you know, own their, the provision of their services and so on. Yeah, the video you're talking about is uh, Andy Street, the uh, West Midlands Mayor. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, and also you, you've been helping there to get that set up, haven't you? So, do you want to explain that now before we go to the video? He can't be here because he's on his holidays, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. I think we can go to the video. Do you want to go to the video, then we sort of look like debrief it afterwards, yeah. yeah? Okay, cue the video. Yeah. Hi there, Andy Street, Mayor of the West Midlands here, and delighted to be able to say a few words for the Co-ops UK Congress in Manchester. I thought I'd do it live from Birmingham, within the background. Wonderful Birmingham Municipal Bank building, because I thought, in a sense, that embodies the spirit of the Co-op Municipal Bank, as far as my money as a youngster. And of course, my personal history is of understanding the uh, cooperative movement through the employee ownership piece of John Lewis, perhaps the biggest social enterprise in Britain, where I was lucky to be the boss for a number of years. So it's deep in my heart. It's also, of course, wonderful that we've now got the ownership of the uh, activity that we've done with you here live in the West Midlands. So thank you for your support for us here. I'm also really pleased to say that it's not yet finally confirmed, but I am fully expecting the cash that we've kept here in the region on the underspend from the Commonwealth Games. Yes, an underspend, can you believe it? About £70 million, the underspend on our games. Some of that will be being used specifically to support the social economy, something we've long wanted to do in the West Midlands, have a specific fund. I'm optimistic that that will be finally confirmed in the next few weeks. So I hope what you take from that is our utter endeavour here in the West Midlands to be part of your goals, ambitions, values. I do know that at the heart of what you do, there's a better way of doing business. Thanks very much for all you do to lead that. Talk about the weather in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a hurricane. <laughs> yeah. So, so he's setting the scheme in the West Midlands. Do you want to explain what he's actually doing there and your role yeah. in it? I've never been so pleased for subtitles um, <laughs> in my life. Um, so as I say, the Ownership Hub, we have one, <coughs> excuse me, already in South Yorkshire and Greater London, and the West Midlands one, it's very much about connecting existing support um, that is already within that place. So the local authorities, um, business advisors, and it's focused on setting up or converting organisations to employee-owned or worker-owned um, primarily, but also looking at how you can bring in a wider stakeholder base. And so it's about offering training, advice, and networking for those organizations and concentrating that in a place 
to see what difference it can, it can make when it's, it's in one place. And is this all over the West Midlands, or is it, is it again, is it a city centre thing only, or is it going out to the outlying towns, or what's... Rose is doing this. Right. It's <laughs> all over the West Midlands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think that's really important, isn't it? We, we, you've got to get these ideas outside to the people that need them. The most, Absolutely, and you really, it should be to the people that wouldn't ordinarily get involved in stuff like this, wouldn't even think about it for them, so it's really important that... There's a real diversity in terms of the, um, the people who are involved in it. And that's why it's so important to make sure that we're not just coming in as, as an organisation or a programme and telling that area what to do. It's about working with the infrastructure that's already there um, to enable this and to provide funding and the support. So in a sense, they're telling you what they want and you're facilitating it? Or Absolutely. Or helping to create the space to make these things happen? Yeah. And, and it's, again, the same problem as you get to these places and people don't understand these their ideas or how they work or even there's a possibility of doing things in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's so that's why it's so important to be able to concentrate in that one particular area. They can learn from one another, they'll hear the messages in different places so they won't feel, as I said earlier, as alone as if they're doing it themselves. I think it's a much more collective um, way of doing this. Um, and I think you know, I'm sure you see it with Claire's as soon as you do something in a place and it's concentrated, you stimulate the people who, work, you know, the people who live there um, to make change, to do things differently. And that's what we hope the Ownership Hub in West Midlands will do. This is not the first you talk about, there's other schemes, other places you've already yeah, set up so like this. So South Yorkshire, that's, so about, that's about 18 months in, I think. So how, how's that going, program? the process out? You know, 18 months down the line, is it getting results? It's getting results in terms of it's generating those conversations and those discussions. We've been embedded within um, the local authority, um, which again means that we're not just coming in and then moving out and nothing changes. When we're going into the local authority, we're working with their business support workers. We've been working with Sheffield Court Development Group and other Court Development uh, workers in the area to be able to look at what's the current support and then what can we bring, how can we add to that? So yeah, really, you know, it's, it's still early days, I guess, but the Greater London one will learn from what we did in South Yorkshire, and I'm sure the West Midlands one will learn from London too. It's interesting because obviously Andy is, is a Tory mayor, so this is this not part of political, is it? This is just, uh, it's, a good, it's a good idea that can work in any environment. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and as Andy said, obviously he was involved with um, John Lewis, which is an employee-owned organisation. As I said earlier, the Employee Ownership Hub, um, Association is involved um, in South Yorkshire within the Ownership Hub and, and in the others. Um, so no, it's not party political and it's demonstrating the values um, and the difference it can make when you involve your employees and your wider stakeholders in the running of your business. I mean, would different political affiliations have different takes on what they would want from a, a co-op movement? Or is it basically they see the sense in as a model for, for anybody? It's, it's be, like we said, it's beyond ideology? I would like to say it's beyond ideology. Cops UK is, you know, we are not party political and so we will work with, we will work with the um, Conservative government, we'll work with um, Labour mayors, mm. we'll work with anyone in terms of ensuring that we get the right results for those places and for those areas. That's what's more important um, and it is, you know, when we're talking about democratising economy, it is, it's around, it's about the people and that's who we need to be providing that support to and not getting caught up in all of the, the politics that goes alongside it. Also, not just politics, but different cultures. So, Ollie, uh, you're setting up a, a music event, bringing back... Uh, when Manchester, like back in the day, had Europe's leading music conference showcase event, which mm. was called In The City. Yeah. And now it's, you're bringing back... Well, created a new one called Beyond The Music exactly. with, with a co-op model, which is an interesting twist, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, picking up the legacy of something from, from the 90s that was done very well here in Manchester, but built on demand, basically, for the music industry. Um, they need a forum to debate what the hell's going on. It's an existential <laughs> crisis at the moment. From an artist's perspective, the, the industry just completely doesn't work. Um, also, from demand from the city of Manchester for something like Beyond the Music to happen. Uh, we launched a couple of months ago at South by Southwest, and we have our first event here in Manchester this October, three-day international music conference and a joined new music festival. And yes, as, as you say, John, we're incorporating as a cooperative. You know, um, we want to forge new alliances in the music industry. The music industry is a place where people usually don't really talk to each other. 
um, but we're finding through the cooperative framework that actually we can bring people together and solve some of those really big strategic issues that the music industry is facing at the moment. I mean, do you think, is the music industry actually a reflection of the way society is as a whole, or has it got its own specific problems, different I, problems? I think so, yeah, because a lot of the stuff you were saying, Sarah, I'm like, yeah, you could copy that and paste it into <laughs> the life of an artist or somebody working in the music business. Mm -hmm. You know, it just works for, for the few people at the top, really, and certainly mm -hmm. from an artist perspe perspective, the whole system uh, needs a reset. So it's definitely uh, mirrored what's going on in life in, in any kind of uh, strand or, or lateral of our life. Um, and you know, there's, there's demand for, for change. So um, we're introducing the cooperative um, model into the music industry. Um, this has been done in other places with labels, etc. but there's not been a conference that does that yet. And it's been really, really interesting, actually. You know, we, as I said, we have our first um, event this October, so we're every day speaking to lots of different stakeholders in the music industry. And there's actually a lot of myst mystification around what a co-op actually is. And we're actually having to be very, very slow with people in bringing them into an understanding as, as to what a co-op is and what, what we're trying to do. Um, it, it's, it's, it's totally bizarre, but I, I went down to London last week and spent a couple of days doing lots of meetings, and, and the comment that came back to me, and I never said this, I never used these words, but people are like, I love this, it's this non-profit event, it's going to da 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 and this, the not-for-profit thing kept coming back to me, so I think people have a perception of co-ops as just being a generally good idea and it, a, akin to a non-profit, but they don't really understand what it is or, or how it works. Um, Can you explain that in the context of Beyond the Music, the idea that it is not, it's not non-for-profit, not for profit, is it? I mean, obviously people get paid, don't they? You're, you're saying people go to, you go to London yeah. and people think you're doing some kind of charity. Well, people in London yeah. don't understand not-for-profit anyway, do they? Yeah. I mean, the, whole, <laughs> the whole concept, let's be honest. Sorry, anyone from London here. Um, but yeah, to explain the concept of, of a non-profit in music, of course, everybody gets paid, mm. you know, especially um, artists need to get paid and mm. everybody who's working at Beyond the Music needs to get paid, but the profit above and beyond that is gonna go back into our social programs, of which we have three, which is gonna, um, you know, foster the next generation of Manchester music legends and also support grassroots venues around the, the city region. Mm. I mean, you've done a lot of work as well beyond, not, well beyond, beyond the music company, you know, yeah. like, you know, work with people on the streets and stuff like yeah. that. So, and those ideas, I guess you picked up there, are influential, what you're doing here now? You know, the music has to be joined onto the real world, doesn't it? I suppose so, but I've always been a socialist from birth, really. So, yeah, you know, I've, I've run a, a social enterprise for the last five years called Peace Meal. We turn waste food um, into amazing meals for people in need in... In Manchester, sadly, we shut down a month ago thanks to the energy companies, but we'll be back for the winter. And, yeah, it does inform what I'm doing with Beyond the Music. Um, I'm not a big one for um, private profit and running off to, to my yacht in Ibiza for the weekend. You know, I think that we need to reinvest in our cities, and particularly in music. When um, people do reinvest in their cities, the effect is... Enormous. So a really great example is Factory Records in the 80s, and, and, and or perhaps not the 90s, they probably broke by then, but certainly the 80s, they paid their royalties to the city. A current example is Michael Addex, um, who's um, H's manager. He runs NQ Live, which is a management company. They do really well, based in East Manchester, I should say. They did really well the last few years, and they went and bought a, a big schoolhouse and converted it into studios, and they now employ... Uh, dozens of, of young people in Manchester in, in the music business. So um, I think the cooperative model is so powerful in music because it's just like any other industry at the moment. It's centralised and, and all the money's at the top. Yeah, NQ is a brilliant example of how music can actually work. Mm -hmm. Uh, not, not, I mean, of course, as employing people, also empowering people, giving people hope. Yeah. And, you know, outside yeah. the normal circles, you know, yeah. they, they've gone right into East Manchester, which is normally ignored quite a lot, mm -hmm. and actually got into the youth there, haven't they? So I think they're a great example of how to do the model mm -hmm. kind of right. And, and that's part of the process of what you're doing here as well, isn't it? Totally. And, and, you know, the mad thing is, being an artist or being in a band or running a club night, you're in a cooperative anyway. But you, it's just like an informal cooperative. Yeah. So I think that we're shouting about that and opening people's minds in the music business. Um, 
hopefully they can formalise these informal cooperatives and um, you know pave the way for new business models in, in Manchester and further abroad. So how, how do you how would you formalise an informal cooperative? Would you actually say, look, we're a co-op. This is yeah. how you do it. Is there a, is there a process? A structure? Well, we're in the process of doing it at the moment ourselves, actually. <laughs> yeah. So I suggest anybody who wants to do that to give Emma or, or Rose a shout and the guys at, at Co-ops UK and, and they can can guide you all guide you through it. I mean, it's a really interesting process. I love the fact that you can make it bespoke to what you want to do and, and, and your business. Um, it's just interesting explaining it to major record labels and trade bodies who um, you have a great conversation with and all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're piling their lawyers on and say, we need to read through this. How does this work? Sure. Blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, I'm trying to make people understand that what's going to happen here in Manchester in October is an experiment. Mm -hmm. And they've got to come down and they can control it and make it what they want it to be. Maybe it's going to take us doing one to show people and maybe year two it's, everyone's going to jump on. Um, not to say we don't have, um, you know, quite a good amount of cooperative members on board already. So we've got some great partners on board. I like the idea of it being an experiment because... You don't know, and you'll find stuff out as you're doing it. You know, we found the yeah. pros and the cons. There are, there are bits that don't work as well, aren't there? I'm sure. Or bits we'll are hard to get out. around yeah. to make to work, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. As, as I'm sure we'll find, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, just looking forward to October, and essentially we want to give people in the music business this platform, and whether they use it or not, it's up to them. Um, and if the, uh, you know, if the major labels fail to use it, then I know loads of independent labels and up and coming artists that will. And perhaps that's the way that, that things are going to go. I think in a sense they already are. There, there's already a breakdown in the business into different models all the time, isn't it? Yeah. It's just which one gets the upper hand, isn't it? It is, and I've got to be slightly diplomatic because we're hoping that all the major labels are going to come to our conference <laughs> in October. Yeah. But totally, I think and it's... cooperate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think it's, you know, it, it's just really empowering, isn't it? And the further the cooperative model comes along, the more and more it's going to be adapted in music. Um, I know the co-op is powerful across the board, but I do think that in music we're one of the industries where we're super close to our product because it comes from the end of our fingers or, or mm. our vocal cords. So mm. I actually think that the music industry could be a really good place to develop the cooperative model and any other kind of revolutionary ideas that are coming out in the world at the moment. So uh, Jay, is Jay Taylor here? Or was... Jay, uh, is, the mic, is the roving mic around? Because uh, Jay, you've been involved in the campaign for, by the Music Venue Trust to uh, buy back the venues from private landlords. And no, the mic's on its way. And adopt, adopting some of these ideas that we talk about up here in a, in a grassroots level, isn't it? You know, basically in the venues in all the small towns, the Boltons, whatever, all the small towns up and down the country, applying these ideas in a practical sense. Yeah, so uh, um, for those who don't know, the Music Venue Trust uh, charity formed in 2014 to protect, support and improve uh, the UK's grassroots music sector, of uh, live sector, which the, those grassroots venues, it's about 950, dancing around 1,000 across the nations. Um, so my main role is I'm in MVT's emergency service, so when venues are faced with challenges, they tend to come to me and my uh, colleague Sophie or one of our um, other national uh, colleagues and we try and kind of stop them from closing or kind of fix the problem they've got. Um, one of those big problems is 90% of the sector's got a private landlord. And that they're, they're, eight, they're generally 18 months away from a rent review and that thing's only going in one direction. So, understanding that, but also understanding that when these, these venues were largely pieces of, of, of community work anyway, they often didn't realise it. The campaign was to, to put um, a community share offer together to buy back some of those venues and put them into community ownership. And so we've just raised two and a half million quid, nine of them, we're in the process of, of buying nine of them now. I think we'll probably have the first couple over the next few weeks. Um, one in Greater Manchester, the Snug in Atherton. Um, plenty more in the Northwest. And so that, that, that piece of work is gonna do a series of things. It's gonna bring their rent down because we'll be the landlords and that, that thing's immediately going to be, going to be more reasonable. It's going to put those venues in a more sustainable position because um, in amongst that pro process, they're going to stop being limited companies. They're, going to, they're, they're converting to CICs. And the moment they become a CIC, things completely change. It's relatively easy to do. Um, 
They, it, it could open up to reduce business rates. Uh, in the right circumstances, it could be uh, reduced VAT on ticketing. Certainly, it opens them up to more funding. Um, they, um, it could open them up to access to things like the Crown Commercial Service, so their energy bills, which at the moment is that, you know, beyond landlords is probably the second thing that's kind of bringing these people down, to reduce energy bills through mass procurement through the CCS. Um, but also, I think there was, a, there was an educational piece of this work, because a lot of them were sort of those businesses anyway, but running as a limited company. You know, they, the sector's got a 0.2% profit margin, and, and any money they did have, they reinvested. They weren't, you know, joining Ollie on a yacht. They were, they, were putting it, they were improving access, they were improving their production, they were putting it into programming. And so those, I think there was, there was an educational twist where we were starting to say to the well, this is kind of what you are already. You are pieces of community work. Yeah, so Ollie, do you want to pick up on that, those ideas there? I mean, obviously, you know Jay, you've worked with Jay on these ideas already. And these are the Music Venue Trust idea of owning the venues, I think it's a great idea. It's kind of, to me, it's like halfway between the two, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's great. I mean, it's just a great example of direct action at the moment and, and making a change however it needs to happen. And it does need to happen because if, if they don't own the venues, the venues are going to disappear, bottom line. So um, I love what Music Venue Trust does. I love Jay and I love Mark as well. They're fantastic. And um, yeah, without them, these venues would probably be getting knocked down. So... Um, yes, it, it works in a couple of different ways here. Not only is it the fairest way to propagate the culture and the music and to own it yourselves, mm. but also it's practical, isn't it? It's actually a better way of running a business. Yeah, it is, totally. And I think also, you know, I, I think there's obviously loads of benefits to the cooperative model, isn't it? But at least you're not in it alone. And I think a lot of people who get into music can do it almost quite casually and end up doing stuff on their own or doing stuff un unconstituted. Um, and I think a co-op is just an absolutely amazing, amazing model mm. because you're, you're bringing all of your community on board and, and to be a part of it. I mean, Sarah, so the music world's one thing, isn't it? But does this actually relate to the world that you're involved in as well? So are these some of these ideas, would they work where you're working or some of the ideas in the world you're working in, mm -hmm. would that work towards music as well? I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't see, I don't see why not. You know, I mean, I think there's, some, there's something what you said there, Ollie, about um, that we're you know, not being alone. And, and I think um, a lot of the time, I mean, we do a lot of work with um, local councils and getting them to think about the idea that they are not alone either, that they are, they've got other partners at the local level that, that they can and should be working with to try and make things better for people. So, you know, that could be about using the land and assets that they have to... Um, uh, to really make sure that the benefits of that land and property is actually going back into communities rather than just being sort of siphoned off or, or perhaps making those land and assets available to uh, organisations that want to, want to set up cooperatives. Um, and, um, and one of the ways in which um, we're hoping to kind of develop those, some of those ideas further is a, a new project that, that, we're, we're just, that we've just launched actually where Claire's is going to be working with Co-ops UK, with the New Economics Foundation and with the Centre for Thriving Places um, uh, in three areas across the UK, the um, North East, South Yorkshire and the West Midlands actually as well. And, and in, in, that, in that project, you know, all, all of our individual organisations are trying to you know, make, make a difference on, on these issues and trying to support the social economy. But together, we, you know, you know, I think we, we feel we can make a much bigger, uh, a bigger impact, a sort of, you know, tsunami, if you like, in terms of, you know, tidal wave of, of change in, in places by, by kind of cooperating together and, 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 and helping to really, uh, you know, get the investment, get the support and get the, the buy-in and, and I suppose grow the model. Uh, at, at scale, if you like, um, so that and that's a, a yeah brand new project which we're we're, kick, we're kicking off just uh, in the last few months. So um, yeah, I like what you said there. Is it, I think it's a bottom line here. It's not about siphoning the profits off. It's actually yeah. put them back into the community. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's lots. Of, I mean, you know, if you think of the organisations and the places where we all live, there's lots of you know, there's there's people spe you know council spending money, um, hospital spending money, colleges, um, uh, you know, even people like. Um, the environment agency are spending money, you know, but how can you use that money to like support cooperative development, to um, to support decent jobs for people, to kind of raise the standard of what what people can expect in their place, rather than just thinking about you know the end product and you know getting the kind of the, the, the lowest price if you like. What can you really buy for that investment that's already going into a place and kind of really making that work? 
to support the kind of social economy. Okay, so I'd like, I'd like to throw this out to the floor a bit. I mean, it's, um, the idea of co-ops and community is really important. But I mean, what's it, what's it like practically doing this, setting up a co-op? Is it easy? Is it hard? And how, how much does it actually interact the community anyway? Are these just fancy words or is it actually part and parcel of the community? Does it empower a community? Does it inspire a community? Or does it sometimes feel like a completely separate thing? Does uh, anybody want to interact? Uh, hi, uh, I'm with Lee Spinners Mill uh, CBS. Uh, Lee Spinners Mill is a grade two star listed building over in Lee, for those of you who know Lee. It's next door to, uh, oh yeah, Wigan. Um, and we started redeveloping the mill, um, kind of just not really knowing what to do. Uh, we've now got 64 tenants in there, and one of the things we've recognised is that we need a better model. We've already got cooperation happening within the mill. The tenants are working with each other, they're, they're learning from each other, they're developing, but we've got another mill to develop. And we want to do that much more with the community focus. So, hence establishing a CBS. That will allow us to actually fundraise from the community as well. Uh, one of the difficulties we've had is chasing funding. And that means we've got to fit with what the funders want, not necessarily what we need or what our community needs. So hopefully the CBS model will work in that way. It is about that democracy, it's about providing what people in Lee need, mm. not what external people think we need. Yeah. Uh, so that hopefully will be what we end up with. So is it, is it a problem finding the pots of funding or understanding the language of the funding? Both. Um, yeah. I mean, for example, we can get big money from Heritage Lottery, but Heritage Lottery are obsessed with the outside skin of the building. We don't care. You go and ask the people in Lee what they need, and it isn't a nice, shiny building. What they need is work, training, employment. So it, we, you end up jumping through hoops to try and get that funding. Now, yes, we'll tick the boxes if we need to, because it means that we can use some of that funding to help with the structure of the building, which means that we can then operate within, inside it. But it is often the funders don't get what we're after. The funders kind of have their own objectives and it ain't necessarily fitting with what we want. So we need to get that demystified and we need to get them speaking the language of the people, don't we? They've got to start listening to us. Um, mm. With all due respect, we're the experts. We're there, yeah. we're living it day to day. Uh, we don't need the experts coming in telling us. Also, technically, the funding is ours, mm. not theirs. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I mean, Emma, what, is that something the co-op could get involved in? I mean, obviously you are involved in it, but is yeah. it something that you could get involved further to, to get those people to actually listen to people on the ground, to, you know, to actually do positive schemes? And yeah, and, and I think in terms of the ownership hub, I think that's something that can actually enable that because we are working with organisations already in those areas, including you know, the combined authority. Um, there's no reason why that shouldn't involve funders as well. And I think at a local level, it's about making sure that funders understand actually the impacts that they're going to have in the community rather than ticking those boxes. And we've had this for a lot of years in that co-ops wouldn't be eligible for certain pots of funding. And that's some work that co UK has done over the years to make sure that funders do recognise co-ops and CBSs as being eligible and the impacts that they can have. But yeah, I think it's, de you know, it's definitely something that we, you know, that we could do more of and you know, work in as well through the RAP mm -hmm. programme as well, I think. Um, but yeah, I think it's about funders recognising what the impacts are going to be in those local areas, maybe less so about whether it ticks some boxes um, on, a, on a form. So better communication and people listening? Yeah, better communication yeah. and understanding in those areas where the applications are coming from, what is needed locally in those areas. Because I think generally, if it's a national fund, then it's a national uh, you know, application process mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. And so then you're not able to... Um, to put some of those nuances that you have in, the, in your local areas and what that area really needs and who's involved, um, which can then mean that you're making an application to get the money rather than making an application to get money that's actually going to have an impact in your area. That's a really good point, Sarah. I think uh, with co-op it sort of plays into that as well because co-op is about local areas, isn't it? It's about, yeah. you know, it's not about central funding, is it? You know, this is about, it's about the understanding of local needs, isn't it? And yeah and local solutions. Yeah, absolutely. And people trying to do things for themselves and it makes it very difficult to do something for yourself or as a group of people if you've got external forces that are putting mm. 
unnecessary barriers in, in the way that actually stops you then from doing what your local community needs. And you know, it's the local communities that know what it is that they need. They don't, as you say, you don't need other people coming in and telling you what, what, um, you know, what to do and how to do it. It's about people coming in and listening. And again, with the ownership hub, it's not about coming in and taking over an area. It's about coming in and listening to what the needs are there and then being able to provide the support, the funding and the guidance that you need to enable that to happen. I mean, Sarah, is that something that, you know, Bolton as well? Is there a sense that people don't understand, you know, the makeup of the, of the, of the town, biggest town in Britain, you know, and, uh, and you know, what it needs and its, its own sort of specific needs? Do you mean people as in citizens? Or yeah, the citizens, yeah, the yeah, people yeah. are there, yeah. and, you know, it's, the people there don't seem to understand what they can get, and the people who yeah. can give it to them don't seem to understand what they need to give to them. I mean, ultimately, it's about power, isn't it? You know, there's a, a sort of power imbalance there where, you know, um, example there from Lee, you know, you're, you're, you're having to kind of go with a begging bowl all the time to get, to get money from, from external organisations who aren't based in, in your area and perhaps, you know, need lots and lots of information to be able to, them, to understand and then to, to make a decision on whether to give you the money or not. So I think this, you know, I, that feels like a sort of, you know, heavily centralised system, you know, which, you know, it costs you a huge amount of money in terms of the process, uh, and everything else, and there must, you know, there has to be a, you know, a much more you know, efficient, effective system of, of getting financed organisations who, who are trying to do this work on the ground, you know, out of, out of sheer determination to make things better for each other. You know, it's not like you're making loads of money, is it? You know, so you know, I think there's there's something about recognising that, and you know, maybe there's something that that organisations like, like like ours and and and, and co-ops UK can do to try and you know get some of those points through to people like the, the lottery fund, you know, to. Um, to, to try and you know, make the case for you know decentralising this money and, and getting out much faster, you know. Decentralising the money, that's a good term. Well, thanks for that uh, for question from the guy from Lee near Wigan, arch rivals. You had to mention that. <laughs> uh, is there another point or a question from the floor over here? Hi, uh, Robin Fee from the Building Science Association. Um, a few, few years ago, we got um, a pretty good working group together of the mutual and cooperative trade associations to work with the Treasury on a number of things, one of which was to try and simplify incorporation of cooperatives and to make funding um, more straightforward. So I'm just wondering, with an election coming up, whatever the outcome is going to be in, you know, within the next couple of years, what should we be asking for now? in terms of, and demanding, in terms of making it easier, firstly, to form and grow cooperatives, and secondly, to find that, you know, to, to, to designate that funding and make fundraising easier. Emma? Well, I was just hoping that James Wright, our policy uh, officer, was going to be in the room, and he is not. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, in you know the, there's a wide breadth of things that we could be asking for in terms of, in terms of policy asks. But I think it's something around parity a lot of the time in terms of co-ops do get forgotten and mutuals do get forgotten and left behind. So it's not even mm. about, um, yeah, it, it's parity and, and better. Things, you know, employee ownership, uh, employee-owned organisations, for example, they have particular tax breaks. I think in terms of um, wider worker-owned organisations, we could also be looking at whether or not there's any um, financial benefits and opportunities from actually bringing uh, workers together to own their own capital and the impact that that actually has on the economy is massive but there aren't really those financial incentives to do it and um, so you know um, Robin's going to have the whole list I think in terms of what um, what we want to be asking um, in terms of a general election but I think my point would be it's it's about parity understanding and education around co-ops as well in terms of the impacts and differences um, that they can make um, and I think, you know, what we were talking earlier about devolving some of that power mm -hmm. down to, um, to local areas so that they can take control over what they need rather than that kind of centralised power. I mean, do you, from what you were doing before, do you think it's changed the situation? Do you think, um, you know, does, is the, the model you were trying to present, do you think it needs updating or is it, is it the same? Is it the same problems as when you were doing the report last time? There's very long journeys, yeah. um, but the, the, I mean, there are, it, it is still a lot more difficult to get a cooperative incorporated than it is to get a company incorporated, for example. Like you can do a company in 24 hours, 
Um, and we do not have yet those sorts of government-sponsored pools of cooperative and mutual capital mm -hmm. that you do that you get for uh, you know for, for lots of other schemes. So you know, British Business Bank, for example, does not have a mandate to support cooperatives and mutuals, whereas mm -hmm. it does other businesses. And I think so. Yeah, we yes. see great opportunities. Um, the question is trying to get it over the line. Mm -hmm. Are you optimistic? Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Uh, there was a question over here, I think. Yeah. Uh, this table here. Hi, um, I'm Lenny. I'm from System at Night. We're a music venue, or trying to be a music venue, in South East London. Um, and we're structured as a CBS. Um, and I guess it's kind of following on from your point about like what kind of funding is needed. <laughs> like, all kinds of funding. But I feel like, specifically, like big capital funds that are willing to take risks on co cooperative projects, especially like new projects, but also like there's just not enough funding for like early stage projects to pay the people with the ideas to actually do them. Like we got as much support as I imagine anyone could get, but of all the different funds that we've been offered, there's lots that are able to pay for consultants' time or for like specific bits of work, but there's not really any money to pay us. And it's been a full-time job for two years and we're still not trading. We still don't have our staff on salaries. It's just like taking bits of money where we can get it from different fundraisers and stuff. I feel like that just creates such a barrier to new co-ops existing because the only people who can start them at the moment seem to be people who've got the privilege of free time or disposable income to put towards that. So I feel like that's a really big missing piece of the funding landscape, is just being able to pay people with ideas to take the time to develop it. Is it a model that, you know, the venue itself, is it something that would eventually make money if it got into a position where it could make money? Or is it just something that's very difficult to make money out of? I mean, as we heard from Jay, like, running music venues in general is tough, but, like, our financial model demonstrates that, yeah, we can be financially sustainable in the long run once we're up and running, but... It's just such a high barrier to get there, especially in a city like London where property costs so much. Mm. I mean, we've been incredibly fortunate that our local council in Lewisham have given us a building rent-free for 10 years, which is like amazing. That never happens. Wow. But it's a amazing. derelict building. It's gonna cost us half a million to bring it back into use. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're instantly having to spend that huge amount of money up front. Like, where's that gonna come from? We've been fundraising for two years and we've got just over 300K of that money now, but the longer it takes, the more we're depleting our funds. We're just constantly like chasing our tails, trying to get money in to do it. Mm. I mean, Ollie, what do you think? I mean, I was saying you have to come up with a solution off the back of your hand, but, you know, music, venue, this sounds like it's kind of, it's difficult, it's hard work, but it's amazing what the council have done there as well. It isn't is, it? it just took my breath away. That turns to sounds like, oh my God, Lucian Council did what? I wish <laughs> Manchester City Council did that, honestly. Mm. Um, that's absolutely amazing. And, but and, and that is, for me, that's about, that's what community wealth is about, is about council saying, we've got this venue. Yeah. You know, we've, why don't you use it? You know, because mm. we're not using it. Mm. And that's, you know, getting the wealth out into the community. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But I agree, it's very, very difficult to, to start up any business, you know, let alone a, a, a venue in London. Um, good luck. <laughs> Thanks. And I'll see, I'll see you there as well next time I'm down. I mean, what kind of things would someone like that have to do to make it work? You know, I mean, are you open now? Are you, no. I think raising 300 grand is pretty impressive, actually. That's mm. really good. But you probably need to raise even more to open a club. I don't know. You need your community, don't you? And that's where a co-op comes into it. I don't know if you take subscriptions or have memberships and lots of people interacting with what you're doing. It sounds like you do. So, um, I mean, have, have you got a co-op model? I mean, you're running as a co-op. Yeah. Fit society and we've got just over 900 members wow. but the problem is like it's really hard to engage with members because doing so uses up a lot of our resources and when you don't have a physical space like mm. it's a lot of extra work just to be engaging with your community so we're sort of in this like weird space at the moment we've got all these people and like all this money and we're like trying to get it going but it just feels like we're sort of in limbo for the time being <laughs> What's, what's the actual hold up for it to start? Is, it, is, is the building not finished yet or? Um, we haven't even started works on the building because we need to get all the money together. Oh, and do you need also the money to make the building um, sort of legally usable? Is that, is that what the hold up is? Um, yeah, I mean at the moment it's totally derelict so it's going to need like 350k worth oh, of renovation. 
Um, but, you know, also we can't pay ourselves enough to work as much on the project as we need to, so it's like our time is diverted. You've got 900 members. There must be some of those can help you just do it, just get the thing off the ground, like yeah. old school squats and things. Yeah. No, and they do. Like, the community have been amazing. We've had support from, like, all different kinds of people, like, with different skills and experiences, but it does just take a few people, like, driving it full time, and we're trying to do that. But, you know, you, we can only do it for so long, like, not being paid properly. I think you should definitely persevere. We're going to. We're not yeah. going to stop. We've been out for two Keep years. Keep a touch no about it, now. because I might, I might be able to hook you up with some people. That'd be yeah. great. <laughs> just, just on that, John, I'm just saying as well, Lewisham Council has given you a derelict building. Yeah. OK, so I would be going back to Lewisham and saying to them, look, thanks for this, this is brilliant, but, you know, it's not just about giving us, offloading the derelict building to us. We need a building that we can actually use and maintain. We want you to be part of that story. And we want to tell that good news that you've given us that building, but we need quite a lot of money to make this usable. So thank you, but where's the rest of it? You know? Believe me, that conversation has been happening for a while, but wow. the, the will is really there from them to yeah, help okay. in every way that they can, yeah. but they just haven't got the money. Yeah. There's just no pots of funding available to them. Um, but, you know, if you've got any advice on keeping that conversation yeah, going, yeah, I'd love yeah, to take yeah. you off on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, thanks. Well, that's, that's a really great example of the practicalities of trying to do this. Yeah. I mean, it's all right talking little slogans and ideas, but actually doing it hands-on is a completely different thing. Um, we've only got about two minutes left. Do you want to make a quick point? Yeah, that'd be brilliant. Thank you. Re really interesting. Great discussion. Um, Stephen Jones from the Cult Group. Um, I think the discussion today so far has been around communities of geography, a bit like the venue we've just talked about. Interesting if you've got any views on communities that have no geography, possibly virtual communities, and whether there's a, a role for uh, democratising that as well. That's an interesting idea. That's interesting. I guess it goes back to you. Yeah, and I think yeah, there are examples... Um, internationally of organizations that have done that where they do you know they come together online if they're freelancers or if their members are all you know around the country or around the world i guess um and i think as well cooperatives they they play to that because you don't it's not necessarily all meeting in the same room it's people coming together who have the shared values and are coming together collectively to you know to to meet a common aim um and so yeah it, it definitely doesn't have to be a, a physical building or an asset it can absolutely be those kind of online communities um, as well i can't think of any examples i don't know whether glenn or hannah can do that who work on the ground with with co-ops but you know bicycle delivery co-op that type of thing there you go you don't have to bicycle, be in the same yeah. place yeah. absolutely taxes yes. okay yeah. well thanks everybody i think uh, the clock's beating us so thanks to the panel <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Like I said, we've got that legislation uh, review, but Robin's touched on it. We're gathering right now the Cooperative and Mutual Manifesto, our prospectus that we're going to put in front of all the prospective governments. Uh, there is a session at 1.30 tomorrow about that, if you can feed into it. But if not, Robin can talk to you all day long about this and would love to hear what you think needs to happen because Lenny's just explained it really well and Ollie's touched on it. The will's there, but it's not easy uh, for lots of reasons. So thank you uh, to our brilliant panellists, uh, Sarah Longland, Ollie Wilson, Emma Laycock and John Robb for the discussion. <laughs>